Thank you, Chris, and, and thank you everyone for coming. We were just talking beforehand. It's a, it's a big ask, giving up three hours of your working day. You, no, it's a big ask, giving up an hour of your working day to come and uh, hear a stranger talk about a subject that uh, you may only have a kind of marginal interest in. But, but so thank you. Um, thank you for the invitation, Chris, and for, for hosting. It's lovely to be here. Um, so I'm going to talk about this, this, this little book. Now, if, as Chris said, you've obviously had several talks by people doing books in this series, and I kind of imagine that uh, some of them will start by saying, well, it's a very short book, a very short introduction to a subject. And that the challenge, it's like that old thing, you know, I'd have written you, I'd have written you, a, I'd have written you a shorter letter if I'd had more time. Actually, the kind of trying to capture things in a small number of words is, is extremely difficult. And by way of illustrating, I brought along a visual aid uh, to, to illustrate at least one of the challenges for me. So I'm a, I teach criminology at the LSE, I teach undergraduates and postgraduates. Um, I, I cover one way or another kind of the, the, the range, not everything, but a broad range of topics under this, this heading of criminology, this thing that we do. Um, and a few years ago, I wrote a textbook. So I wrote a textbook for undergraduates. Um, the intention was to try to write a book that would make some money. Um, there was, it wasn't an intellectual enterprise. You know, I've written other things which maybe had some kind of scholarly interest. But the textbook, fundamentally, I mean, there were other reasons. But I was, I was trying to, at the time, I was trying to make a bit of money. Uh, so I wrote the textbook, and this is it. So that's it. It's... Um, this is the third edition, so it's made a few quid. Uh, 1,130, 43 pages. Um, I did a quick word count on the documents when I first sent it in, and it came in at 505,000 words. So it's expanded a bit since then. So writing this thing um, was an interesting challenge. They're, they're supposed to be somewhere between 30, 35,000 words or something. So it's like a really long essay or some such. So what I've tried to do in the book um, is, is capture, is, is ask a series of questions. Has anyone, has anyone here studied any criminology? Oh, God. <laughs> to what level? <laughs> Did a law degree, a bit of criminology? Law criminology. Law criminology. Okay. Criminal Sorry? Criminal psychology. Criminal psychology. Okay, so I'm about to get desperately exposed, probably. I, mean, I was kind of hoping that everyone said, oh, no, I've never heard of it, really. <laughs> Sounded interesting. Okay. Um, but what I thought I'd do within this book was to try to um, cover a few of the topics within criminology that I thought a general audience. So, in the main, people who either knew relatively little or, or nothing about criminology might be interested in them, might give them a kind of taster, particularly if they wanted to follow it a little bit further. So as you can see on the slide, um, the kind of, these, are the, these are the chapter headings in the book. It, just, it says kind of things like, so what, what's crime? Uh, a lot of lawyers in the audience, I think, so we'll maybe have a quick conversation about that. Who commits it? How do we measure it? What's happening to it? Um, bit of a giveaway. In the next one, understanding the crime drop. How do we control it and how do we prevent it? So I'm going to, in my um, however long I've got, um, another 30 minutes or so, scoot through. Is, is I'm going to pick up on a few of those questions. Obviously, can't talk about the whole book, but I'll try and give you a flavour of four or five of those, of those questions. So um, I'll start with um, what's criminology? Um, the main one, I suppose. So... Um, Everyone will be familiar with this. You're in a taxi or a party, or, and someone asks you what, you what you do, and you say, well, whatever you say. And I say, taking a deep breath and sometimes a sigh, say, oh, I'm a criminologist. To which the kind of actually quite pleasing and standard response is, oh, gosh, that's interesting. That must be fascinating. Um, now, the reason, unfortunately, and, and the spoiler, is that people say that is that they've, of course, got an entire misconception of what criminology is and what criminologists do. And then, of course, I bore them rigid, and they realise it's not nearly as exciting as they thought that it was. And the, 
The misconceptions are legion, so all sorts of reasons, all sorts of things that people think criminology is or might be, and criminologists do. Certainly for students, a lot of the time, and criminology is burgeoning at, in the universities now, hence people being able to punt textbooks. Um, one of the reasons I think the criminal, that students have been interested in criminology is that kind of, that, there's the sort of CSI, crime scene investigation time things, the sort of forensics and stuff. They kind of imagine that we're, we're sitting in smart Google style offices with all the latest kind of technologies tracking serial killers and solving crimes and various other things. Now, there are probably one or two people who style themselves as criminologists who are involved vaguely in that kind of thing, slightly more re realistically than CSI, but, but most of us are not doing anything nearly so exciting. Actually, we're, we're, most of us are teachers. Most of us are working in universities, for some of you who are familiar with it, teaching that thing called criminology. Now, it's not really a definable thing, I think. So I think the first thing I'd say about criminology is unlike, you pick your subject, economics, social sciences, sociology, political science, psychology. Criminology is not a discipline, I don't think. It's not a master discipline. Criminology is something which, which rests on other disciplines. So those people who are practitioners are, are all of those things, are, are lawyers, sociologists, historians, political scientists, psychologists, and, and all the rest. And criminology is a kind of amalgam. It's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the, excuse me, bastard child of a variety of 20th century disciplines. But its focus, I think, is this thing at the bottom here. So there's a picture of a famous, probably the most famous 20th century criminologist, a guy called Edwin Sutherland, an American who worked most of his career in Chicago, famous Chicago school of sociology and criminology, who defines criminology as essentially these three, three things, the study of the making of laws, the breaking of laws, and society's reaction to the breaking of laws. So. What do we criminalize? Which things do we treat as criminal? Um, and why? And how that changes? We'll come back to that momentarily. Um, what is it? Um, the, 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 how do we understand uh, deviance, the breaking of those rules, laws, and so forth? Um, and how do, we, how do we respond to those forms of deviance and, and why, and how, how do our social responses to those things, things differ. So that, I think, broadly speaking, still serves, even though it's 80, 90 years old now as a definition, still broadly serves as a pretty good indicator of what criminology is. So as promised, let's start with something that should be pretty straightforward and certainly straightforward for an audience here. So the question for us is, what's crime? Over to you. What is crime? Anybody? And no right answer, of course, to this, but what, it, what? Breaking the law. Breaking the criminal law. Breaking the law? Yeah, breaking the law. Yeah. So it's 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 comparatively contingent things that we do here we may not do elsewhere. Yeah. So it's 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 the breaking of laws. So, but if I were if I'm if I'm an academic who's interested in that and I'm I'm simply so I am am I simply interested in the breaking of laws within a particular jurisdiction? Well, probably probably not. How about what do we mean by the breaking of laws? Does someone, someone actually have to be caught breaking the law for me to be interested in that as a criminologist? Or is it forms of behavior that in principle could be criminalized? Or what about those things which aren't yet, or which aren't, don't reach a criminal threshold? What about the, that, fa that acronym that became so famous under new, the new Labour government, ASBO, Anti-Social Behavior Order? Not, not, uh, not criminal offenses, causing harassment, alarm, and distress, so sub-criminal, but entirely the sort of thing that was dealt with by criminal justice system in a variety of ways. Crimes for us, I think, in all sorts of ways, and we just deal with this very briefly, a highly problematic thing, not least because, as pointed out, it's, it's, it's culturally relative. The way in which we deal with 
theft or rape outside or inside marriage or murder or a whole variety of other offences will vary extraordinarily from, potentially, from country to country, but also historically. So what are we allowed to do um, and what's criminalised at certain points in time, as we know, changes? So first, just very quickly, two examples. Something that's criminal now that wasn't 100 years ago in this jurisdiction. Cybercrime, because it didn't exist. How about something that existed? Smoking indoors. Smoking indoors. I love that one. That's a cracking one. <laughs> tobacco. So we've criminalised various. So we're now the regulation of tobacco consumption is 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 really really tight. All sorts of ways in which you now can't do this, and this is very very new. So what about the reverse? Okay, things that we now can do that we couldn't. Uh, probably wasn't criminalised, was it? But we're, we're close, I think. Gay marriage. Gay marriage. Gay marriage. Very good one. So, again, so a whole so a variety of things to do with sexual relationships, to do with women's reproductive health. We could go on and on and on. So, when we're thinking about these things, um, we, need, we, need to be, we need to be acutely aware both of historical change and cultural relativities. But then, criminalisation. So let's just think about it a little bit more, and I might come back to this briefly at the end, depending on time. Um, the creation of criminals. So I think in a lot of popular discourse, in a lot of public conversation about crime, political conversation about crime, we will use the word criminals, and we will, or I hope I won't, some people will use the word criminals as if there's something essential about the person, that, that a criminal is a type of person separate from someone who's not a criminal. So we go all the way back to the 19th century, for those who are familiar with it, kind of the phrenologists who studied the, you know, the shape of the skull and the size of the forehead, all a bit unfortunate for me and things, you know, but physical characteristics which were thought to be associated with criminality are, are just the, as it were, the kind of historical precursors of those who now think that there are a variety of other biological or psychological or, or mixed socio-biological characteristics which somehow distinguish the criminal for the, from the non-criminal. So are criminals a class apart? So, but it's just a question to think about. So have you, have I, or anyone in your immediate family done any of the following? And as I say, don't need to put hands in the air. I mean, obviously feel free if you wish, <laughs> but probably best not. Have you or anyone in your immediate family, including me, smoked, smoked cannabis, driven a car with excess alcohol in the bloodstream, stolen something from a shop, or downloaded music or some other material for free when it should have been paid for? Right. So would anyone like to put their hand up and say that they think that neither they nor anyone in their immediate family has ever done any of those things. Don't worry, you don't have to. But congratulations if there is someone, because I reckon you're in a tiny minority. Okay, tiny. Just very quickly, lifetime, studies of lifetime usage of cannabis. If we do a survey, representative sample of adults in the country, um, what proportion will say that they have ever smoked cannabis, do you think? Yeah, probably, somewhere between 35 and 50%. So one in three, one in two, somewhere, depending on where we do it and all the rest of it, how we ask the questions. Driven a car with excess alcohol in the bloodstream. Well, we don't really know, but it's, sorry? 20. Yeah, I'm not quite sure, but I reckon it's, I, I reckon you're not, you're, it's people probably, probably I think it's probably, well, a lot of people won't necessarily know that they've done it as well, which is the other thing. So if you go to jurisdictions where there's very low blood alcohol levels permitted, awful lot of people who will be caught with excess alcohol are caught with it because they drank the night before, not on the day. And it's a, it's a as it were, genuine mistake, but they're breaking the law and so forth. So the numbers are actually probably pretty high if we're taking it as a lifetime thing. Um, stolen something from a shop. Again, self-report studies, really variable. Estimates vary from 20% to 50%. Uh, we will probably take it somewhere 
as being in that range. Downloaded music and material for free when they should have paid for it. Well, we, we, we don't know. There was a, a well-known Australian study of a few uh, download sites which discovered hundreds of thousands of people downloading illegally material in a, I can't even remember what it was, a three or four day window. If you extrapolate from it and do it very carefully, it means probably, it, frankly, it means most of us have broken that law. Okay, so the idea somehow the criminals, this is the simple, simple thing I want to establish, are somehow separate, are somehow different, yeah, is nonsensical. Yeah? We all break the law, if that's going to be the thing that determines our discussion here. So let's just park it and we'll come, maybe come back to one or two of these things. But this begs a question, because most of the things that I've been talking about here, or we've been talking about here, are maybe not that serious. Some people would think they were terribly serious. They're probably drinking and driving is pretty serious. Some people will think drugs are serious. Um, but what about really serious offences? What about homicide or serious violence and, and so forth? Are, are, does the same thing apply? Are, you know, are there distinguishing features? Can we see things in the constitutions, the makeups, the psychologies of people who are involved in the most serious forms of offending which distinguish them? Well. In some cases, there's, there's psychopathy and so forth, which, which may play some role in, in, in very serious offending. But most of the time, really, what we're talking about, even there, even in the most serious offending, is what we'd call risk factors, which is there are certain characteristics in, people, uh, in people's um, physical and psychological makeup, but also in their social environment, which increase the likelihood that they may become involved in various forms of serious offending. But usually only when those risk factors are found in, in multiple form. And even then, that's a kind of an increase in, in probability. It's not, a, it's, not, it's not predictive, effectively. So we have to be terribly careful. So what is crime and who are criminals is, I think, um, as it were, subject matter which is intrinsically complex. And if I would want to get, as it were, one simple message across from that, it's that anyone who tries to therefore to persuade you that our responses as a society to crime and to people who break the law are simple things, that there are somehow simple solutions to this thing, are obviously misleading you and obviously haven't understood the complexity of the world that they're trying to deal with. Um, if I just go back slightly, criminals are class apart and criminalization. So the second bullet point, the creation of criminals. Um, who do we find? If you, if you spend, has anyone spent any time, um, I don't mean as a defendant, um, as an observer or something, or uh, as a lawyer even, in a magistrate's court or the lower courts of any country? Been to witness. What sort of people do you see? Who are the defendants? What type of people? If you were just broadly characterising them. Poor. Yeah. They're poor. Absolutely. Our courts, especially our lower courts, where which, which is where the bulk of the business gets done, is full of relatively poor, disenfranchised people. Yeah, they're the people who are involved in these forms of crime which make up the bulk of the business of our criminal courts. It's important to remember because that's what our justice system is doing. Our justice system is broadly focused on a certain part of the population. Frankly, not us, I'd hazard. Yeah? Most of us, most of the time, are probably going about our lives relatively inured against, relatively insured against interaction with the justice system. It may happen to you, but nothing like the likelihood that it would happen to you if you were poor, you were homeless or unemployed or whatever else. So just very quickly, what, um, what rarely finds itself in our justice system? Corruption, state crimes, the crimes of the wealthy and the powerful, large-scale frauds, much small-scale fraud, actually, money laundering, tax-related offences, 
health and safety related offences, deaths and injury at work, the, 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 the crimes of employers and so forth. Yeah? Again, just a corrective to some of the assumptions I think about the ways in which crime and justice is, is often talked about. Yeah? The justice system focuses on the poor. It does not focus upon the powerful and the wealthy. So crime, what is crime? That's, that's what's crime, what are criminologists kind of interested in? Well, there's this, some beginning to it. So what's happening to crime? That's been in the news just recently. Um, what is happening to crime in England and Wales? What, does anyone know what the pattern of crime is in England and Wales in recent times? Pick your own, pick your period. It's going down. How long has it been going down for? Take a guess. Sorry? <laughs> since the current government were in power, there's... Oh, right, okay, so since 2015. Okay, and... It, sorry? Oh, well, that's what all politicians probably tell you, but yeah. Um, but then the other corrective would be, um, that's not, it's nothing, this is not to do with politics. So politics doesn't control levels of crime. Controls much about the levels of responses to crime, but we'll come back to that momentarily. So, so not since 2015, a little bit longer than that, actually. Anyone another guess? I'll be Brucey. 2011. 2011, a little bit earlier. A little bit earlier. Come on, be confident. 1930. 1930. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very good. Okay, so enough. Right, mid 1990s. So this is England and Wales. Um, what's happening to crime? So, so far as we know, and I'm going to do all sorts of caveats here. I'll come back to it. So far as we know, crime rose pretty steadily from somewhere in the late 1950s through to about the mid-1990s, and then it started to decline. And according to the main measures that we have, it's been in decline for the last 20 years. And not just in decline, but in steep decline. So if you look at the general trends there on the left and the right, you can see the peaks, and you can see just how steep the decline seems to be. So the question is, how do we know? Well, two measures of crime. The first is what we call police recorded crime statistics. It's basically the data collected by law enforcement agencies, the, the police in England and Wales, the, the police departments, the FBI in the US, and so forth. So they collect things. They then, according to administrative rules, they divide them up into different kinds of categories, the kinds of things that you'll then find as criminal offences in the courts. And the measure over time gives us a sense on the left here of what's happening to reported crime trends. Now, there's a whole heap of problems with reported crime statistics. The most obvious ones are the very simple ones, of course, is all that is recorded there is stuff that comes to the attention of the police. How much crime comes to the attention of the police? Way less than half. So huge amount of stuff is never being recorded. Then, even if it comes to the attention of the police, will they record it as crime? Well, not necessarily. Um, they're supposed to, and they're supposed to do it in standardized ways, but for a variety of reasons, some perfectly understandable, some less forgivable, they, they, they don't. And so it's pretty iffy. So therefore, in this country, from around the 1980s, we, we used another measure. We decided that we'd use sort of standard social scientific techniques to try to measure crime. So we'd do a survey, basically a household survey. We'd take a representative, in inverted commas, sample of the population, and ask them questions about what they'd experienced in the last 12 months. Had they been victims of a whole range of crime, plus a bunch of other questions. It's originally called the British Crime Survey, now called the Crime Survey for England and Wales. It's the measure on the, on the right-hand side there, uh, hence it only starting in 1981. But it's, it's broadly considered to be our most accurate measure of crime. And that's kind of what it shows. Now, there's a whole bunch of problems with the British Crime Survey, or the Crime Survey for England and Wales as well. I'll go into loads of detail. I'll come back to one at the end of what I've got to say uh, this afternoon. Um, but it's, a, as I said, it's a survey of households. So it doesn't include anybody who's not living in a standardised household. It doesn't include people who are homeless, doesn't include students, doesn't include people, doesn't include prisoners, and so on and so forth. 
And until very recently, um, it only, uh, the interviews were only with people aged 16 and above. So it didn't include young people who have very high levels of victimization. But broadly speaking, that's what's happening to crime. Um, there's America. Looks very similar pattern. Peaks slightly earlier than England and Wales, but it's the same broad pattern. These are FBI reports, so the kind of police recorded crime type thing. That's Canada, just the top line is all one needs to look at. It's the same general trend, peaks in the early 1990s, in decline ever since. So this is not something specific to England and Wales. This is, this is being watched across Western liberal democracies. A broad rise in crime through to somewhere around the, the late 80s, early 90s, and then, and then a drop. And a consistent and what appears to be a sustained drop in crime. So... Why? Why is crime falling? Now, I'd better do this quite quickly, but um, how many? Six quick reasons, possibly. So one's economics. Is economic change driving, well, the rise and the fall in crime? Uh, the answer, I think, is no. It may be having an effect, um, but it's not clear, I think, how much of an effect or what the effect relationship, as it were, is. So we've had one of the most significant economic downturns in the last decade or so, a period in which crime has been going down. If there were going to be a relationship, you would expect it to be the other way around. That is, you would expect, I think, that the disappointing and negative economic circumstances would lead to increases in crime. And to the extent, I think, that we have reliable information about these things, there is something of a relationship between economic recessions and, and rises and falls in property crime, not violent crime, necessarily. Again, I think for reasons that one can imagine. But the bulk of research about the nature of the relationship between... Um, the economic fortunes of societies and crime levels is, I think, at, at, at best mixed. Shows no clear and consistent relationships. There's probably slightly better evidence about the nature of social inequality or the relationship between social inequality and crime. But again, I think that's also quite general and certainly not enough to explain the things that I think we're seeing in terms of really significant increases and declines in crime. So what then about the politician's favorite, favorite thing, punishment? The assumption in a lot of political discourse is if crime's out of control, we're just not taking it seriously enough and we must get tougher. Yeah, it, that, was, that was the political message of the 1990s across the political spectrum in this country and in, indeed in the US, for example, as well. So more punishment equals less crime. And superficially, it might look like it. This is, um, I think, in some ways, one of the most terrifying kind of basic bar charts you can produce in terms of recent trends in crime and punishment. This is the federal and state prison population and incarceration rate, you can ignore the incarceration rate if you like for the time being, in the United States, 1950 to 2013. And basically what you see is the, the numbers of people in prison was relatively stable in the 1950s, 1960s, really up until the late 1970s. And then it exploded and rose and rose and rose at an, at an extraordinary rate to the point at which the incarcerated population of the United States reached 2.3 million people. 2.3 million people. So something the equivalent of, I'm going to forget which American cities now, but the populations of something like two or three sort of medium-sized American cities incarcerated at any point in time. But of course, differentially imposed. Who's incarcerated? Well, who's incarcerated, of course, reflects who comes before the courts, the poor, minorities, African-Americans in particular. 
in specific geographical areas. So you've got suburbs of American cities, you've got neighborhoods of American cities where somewhere between one and two and one and three young African-American men aged between 20 and 35 are in prison. Just terrifying figures. So you've got this huge increase in punishment, roughly at a time or just preceding the point at which crime starts to fall. So it looks pretty good for politicians, I think. But actually, you just start to do some fairly basic things and the relationship between changes in the uses of just imprisonment, in this case, is one, the most serious form of punishment, really, that we have. Some states obviously still have the death penalty, but only use it in small numbers. But the relationship between rises and falls in, in imprisonment and rises and falls in crime is just hugely inconsistent. Just across the bar chart here, you've got states which, are, have, which show dramatic increases in the use of imprisonment, um, but actually very small rises have rise, small rises in crime and the reverse. You know? No consistent relationship at all between patterns of punishment and crime. Which is not to say punishment has no effect, but if we try, or as people have tried, to estimate its impact Frankly, in terms of the American crime decline in recent time, the best estimate suggests that the most, probably, that the imprisonment boom, what some people would call mass incarceration in the United States, the, the, the greatest possible extent that it influenced the crime decline was maybe 10 to 15%. So the remainder is being affected by other things, possibly the economy in part, but it must be a variety of other factors. One possibility, and a famous one in the US, is the suggestion is that policing made a big difference. Now, the reason that this got so much play in the US is largely because of the so-called New York miracle. Um, from the early 1990s onwards, serious crime in New York City uh, declined, and declined hugely. So some, some bare figures there. These, these are what the Americans call index crimes. These are the main crimes that go to make up uh, law enforcement statistics. And you can see there across homicide, burglary, larceny, forcible rape, the declines in less than a decade in recorded crime are between a third and three quarters across all categories of crime. Or if you reverse it, as I've done there for homicide, and take, the, take from 2007, the homicide level in 2007 in New York City was 18% of the 1990 level. So by any measure, something extraordinary happened. Now, the smiling face some will recognize is Rudolph W. Giuliani, one or two-time mayor of New York City, and subsequently, well, let's not go there. Um, he hired a man called Bill Bratton as his first commissioner of police uh, for a couple of years. Uh, Bratton then went on to the private sector, then to LA and then back to New York City. Between them, two media savvy people, essentially they stole the story that the crime decline, the New York miracle, um, was the result of policing. Yeah, crime is down, blame the police was their tagline, okay? Is it true? Well, actually, I think the same thing that I've concluded essentially about the economy and about punishment probably applies to policing, which is, yeah, I think it makes a contribution, but it explains only a small part of the picture. So, slightly complicated, multicolored bar chart, don't really need to pay too much attention. Essentially, what you've got there is those main index crimes again, homicide, rape, robbery, assault, etc., etc. And the, the colourful lines are the, what's happened to each of those crimes in the 10 main American cities. So basically, crime's been going down, as we saw, across the US. All its big urban centres have experienced really significant declines in crime. But the black line in all of these is New York City. And you can see that in almost all cases, the decline in New York City is bigger, bigger than LA and Chicago, Houston, wherever else. Now, 
one interesting study, I think, which analysed in great detail what happened in New York City, said, well, look, actually the crime decline that we've seen in US cities can't be put at the door of the police. What the police did differed from urban centre to urban centre, so it's hard to use it, I think, as a sort of simple explanation for what we've witnessed. But maybe, and there's evidence to suggest this is possible, that, as it were, the crime dividend in New York City, the extra decline that they witnessed, was largely a product of policing. The, the particular strategies that the New York Police Department operated in the 1980s and beyond may well have contributed to the this, this somewhat greater decline in crime that New York experienced compared with its major urban uh, peers. What would those things be? Well, very simply, essentially policing has two major strategies. One is to do with numbers, which is a matter of controversy in this country, and there's this city in particular at the moment. Numbers increased dramatically, which I think much more in New York City than other American cities, but also, and something I'll come into moment, momentarily, depending on time, um, it also got a little smarter in the way it did policing. It concentrated, it focused its resources on those places where crime was concentrated and on those things which were likely to have the greatest impact. And so maybe policing. Security and prevention is the fourth possibility. So there's now something within criminology called the security hypothesis, which essentially says the real way in which we got smarter from around about the 1980s onwards was in terms of crime prevention, was rather than thinking about post hoc things like punishment, you know, crime gets dialed in, flash the blue lights, pick up the perpetrator, stick them through a court and then imprison them and imagine we've solved a problem, frankly is not the way. What we need to be thinking is proactively, where are the problems? What's the sources of those problems? And can we do something about it? And there's something called routine activities theory. Those who've studied a bit of criminology may have come across this. It's essentially a rational choice theory. It, it, it treats us all as rational actors, for, for good or ill, and kind of says, look, in the main, when people do stuff, bad stuff, they do it because they're making a calculation. They're making a calculation that this is in some way however partial their rationality, this is in some way worthwhile. So routine activities theory divides, as it were, the kind of what it calls the chemistry of crime into three things. It's a nice little scientific sheen to it there. It says there will be three things, a motivated offender, so someone who wants to steal something or do some other thing, a suitable target, something they want to steal or some train they want to graffiti, and an absence of capable guardians. So an, if, an insufficient kind of variety of folk out there who will stop them from doing it. And basically it says, look, if you change any of those things, you're likely to make crime more difficult. And if you do that, actually, it will reduce. So there are three basic, well, there are more than three, but three central things that you can do. One is you can increase the effort that's involved in crime whole variety of ways. So there's a picture of, of alley gates there, very simple thing, but you know, British terraced houses have back alleys where bins used to be kept. People now, as a kind of fairly standard thing, have started putting up gates with locks to stop people being able to wander up and down. We have a variety of techniques which locks become more sophisticated. We have lights that go on. We all sorts of things, yeah, to try to make places or people more secure, which means doesn't stop someone from breaking into a house, for example, but might make them think twice. It makes it slightly more difficult. Or we can increase the perceived risks. The most obvious one being we can make people feel they're being watched, which is a favourite one in this country because we are the world capital of... Absolutely. Does it work? Well, evidence is mixed, but let's not, we don't depress ourselves further. But nonetheless, we can, we can do a variety of things to try to increase the perceived risks, change the kind of mentality, 
or we can reduce the anticipated rewards. So there's a picture there of um, a train covered in colorful graffiti, new, back to New York City. There was a huge problem in New York City subway in the 80s and the 90s. Trains, one of the problems, trains covered in graffiti. Now, part of the strategy of the transit police and the NYPD was to try to do something about it alongside all the other things they were trying to do. How do you reduce graffiti on the subway? Actually, it turned out to be relatively simple. They cleaned the trains. And they cleaned them regularly. So as soon as graffiti appeared, they took the trains into the yard, cleaned them down, washed them down, and put them back into service. Over time, and actually relatively quickly, it had the impact of not stopping, but massively reducing the graffiti problem. The reason being motivation. Why does the tagger want to put what graffiti on a train? Well, partly it might be quite fun, the process. They're artists, after all. But no, it's fundamentally, it's about being seen. It's the tag. It's the public visibility. So if you get rid of that, if you get rid of the payoff, the argument was, actually, you'll reduce the problem. Yeah? Now, how am I doing for time? A couple of minutes. So, the security hypothesis. We, we have become really smart at doing a variety of things in relation to crime. So the, an obvious one here is cars. So when I was a kid, um, which is obviously, as you can tell, looking at me some time ago now, um, I'll say it no more strongly than I knew some people who were interested in stealing cars. Stealing cars was really easy to do. It was really easy to do because cars had almost no security facilities. Um, so there was a particular make, and I forget it now, but there was a Ford, and it was either a Cortina or an Escort or something like that, which um, certainly the urban myth had it, and even if it wasn't true, it wasn't a million miles away, only had, there were only about a dozen keys in existence which would open every single one in the country. Yeah? There was no such thing as a unique key for the car. Essentially, manufacturers had got away with, for years, decades, with not having or not bothering to think about the crime implications of the business that they were running. One of the things that we've done in the last 30 years, or manufacturers have done, sometimes under pressure from governments, is to massively change now the ways in which cars are configured, making car theft extremely difficult to do. The consequence being a plummet in car crime, a huge influence, a huge drop itself being a volume crime, which has contributed very significantly to the crime drop. And the argument in the security hypothesis is that actually if you stop car crime, you make young people who might, in particular, who might get involved in other forms of crime much less mobile. And actually you then stop other forms of crime as well. Okay? So just reading across, the argument of the security hypothesis is that Essentially, we've become, across a range of things, much, much smarter at prevention. And that arguably is the single greatest contributor to the crime drop of the last 20 years. So, a couple of final things, and I'll stop. There is one problem with um, crime prevention ideas, one major one. It's called displacement which is that sense of, well, if you make crime more difficult to do around Victoria Station, well, maybe people will go to Waterloo or St James's Park or Embankment or whichever, the next one along. If you make crime more difficult in one estate or one part of an estate, maybe people will simply go elsewhere. And to a degree, there is evidence to suggest that some of the time that is true, but not always and quickly. There's a really famous story called the British Gas Suicide Story, which sounds all very depressing, but it's very illuminating. And essentially, it's a simple picture here which shows the decline in suicide um, in the 1960s and through the 1970s, largely as a result of changing domestic gas supplies. 
Up until the 1960s, domestic gas supplies were toxic. You have carbon monoxide in the domestic gas supplies. An awful lot of people, very sadly, opened their ovens, put their heads in and killed themselves. The domestic gas supplies were changed, making them no longer toxic, with the effect that that form of suicide, that method by which people ended their lives, of course, declined almost to nothing. What was interesting about it, though, for the purposes here, is that it didn't result in any great number of people finding alternative means of killing themselves. So actually there was no displacement. It was a preventative effort and a long-standing one. Now, I'm running out of time, so I won't do it, but there is some sort of slightly counter, there is some evidence which goes in a slightly different direction <coughs> in relation to catalytic converters in cars, which again has had the same impact of stopping that largely as a as a, as a means of ending one's life, but in that particular case, it does seem to have a displacement effect. Three final points and I'll stop. Thank you for your, your patience. So there's two final, slightly left field theories, which you've probably heard about, which I'll just say a brief word about, about the crime drop. One comes from the book Freakonomics. Famous economist, and a journalist who wrote a hugely best-selling book, he says enviously, um, about a variety of, of <coughs> applications of economic ideas to real-world problems. And one of them is the crime decline. And their argument in the book is that in the United States, the, the, the changes relating to the constitutional position of the termination of pregnancy so the Roe versus Wade decision that was taken by the Supreme Court in the early 1970s had an impact on crime. Broadly speaking, a very controversial argument is that from 1973 onwards, legalised abortion was, was generally freely available. Those people who were most likely to take advantage of this new possibility were those women who were predominantly um, in the social groups and categories who would be at greatest risk, as it were, of having children who would go on later in life, for all the risk factors I was mentioning earlier, to become involved in crime. Now, actually, they terminate their pregnancies, don't have those children. There's a cohort of young people who would have been more criminal, who, who now weren't. And hey presto, actually, the point at which they would have started offending in any number is round about the point at which crime starts to decline. So about 16 years or so, 17 years or so after Roe versus Wade. Sounds very neat, actually not necessarily that plausible. First of all, well, two reasons. Firstly, that actually the evidence doesn't suggest or doesn't support terribly strongly the idea that, frankly, those were the women who mostly took advantage of the new legal situation. But secondly, and I think even more damningly, it doesn't apply anywhere else. So in England and Wales, abortion was legalised seven years before was the case in the United States. Crime began to drop probably about three to four years later. So the lag makes no sense in terms of the hypothesis. And then finally, lead in petrol. Lead in petrol is a fascinating one. Why might this have an impact? Because lead in petrol is very closely associated with a variety of behavioural disorders in young people. Impulsiveness, aggressiveness, and a whole variety of other things. But we removed it, or it's declined massively. And it links very much in the same kinds of way as the previous arguments in relation to termination of pregnancy with a slightly lagged delay in the drop in crime. And the great thing about the lead in petrol argument is that it would also help you explain the rise in crime as well as the fall because of the increasing use of motor vehicles in the post-war period. Now, there's an ongoing academic debate about this. And again, all I'll say is I think the evidence is extremely mixed on this subject. Probably not something we should in at all discount, but again, and unlike many of the things that I've already discussed, probably treat as being no more than one contributory element in the things that we need to be thinking about 
when considering this complex issue of the crime decline. So my final sentence then will be, that's I think how we might explain it. By thinking about all those things and probably more things besides, but with a but, which is actually, is it really declining? Ah, now, um, the parallel here. So a few years ago, um, the LSE, like so many universities, uh, is, ex well, a bit like Google, actually, expanding its campus in all sorts of ways. You know, we like nothing better than a new building. It shows the university is being successful. <laughs> <coughs> Pay the staff more, I say. But anyway, um, <laughs> no, we, we, on Lincoln's in Fields, um, a few years back, we opened a new building. And the Queen, bless her, came along to open it. And um, the director, the vice chancellor, as it were, the LSE was there, and, and two or three senior academics, um, a couple of whom were economists. And in her very low-key way, in this opening, as she walked through to unveil the plaque or whatever, in her very low-key way, she turned to one of these economists and said, I'm interested to know why you didn't spot that there was going to be a financial crash. There was a kind of stunned silence in the room and lots of activity in later years to try then to explain exactly what had been going on. But it was, anyway, this octogenarian had, had, had embarrassed the assembled economists of the LSE. I only say, I say this partly because, of course, criminologists are prey to exactly the same things. If we went back to the 1960s, criminologists generally... Um, I think we're of the view that fairly soon this increasing crime trend that was going on would stop and as we became more prosperous and social democratic and it would it would it would peak and then it would start to drop uh, but oh no completely the reverse happened it rocketed through the 60s through the 70s through the 80s to the point at which criminologists collectively said to themselves you know it's never really going to stop is it it's just going to go on and on and on. I mean, it may slow, but, uh, but then it started to drop, and drop seemingly hugely. So we're just as bad, it seems, probably because some of us are economists, no. Um, just as bad as spotting trends. But the thing with the drop here, I think, is it's just possible that we're measuring the wrong things now, that crime has changed. And we, we briefly touched on it at the beginning. The big thing here, and I'm standing in the right place, I guess, is the internet. Young people's behaviours have changed and much crime has changed. Now there's an awful, awful lot of fraud, for example, but a whole variety of other ICT, internet-based forms of criminal or related activities, I think, are now done out of the sight of the criminal justice agencies that have traditionally been responsible for intervening in these things. So the Crime Survey for England and Wales, at, at, at just to try to play catch up with a little bit of this, is now starting to try to measure things like internet-based crime and fraud and so forth. And just doing that, and nothing more, doubles the level of crime that it's measuring. So if crime is going down, it's going down much less than we thought. And at the very least, I think probably we need to think very carefully about whether it's going down at all. I've overstayed my welcome, so I should stop. Thank you very much indeed. Tim, thank you. That's, that's a um, brilliant talk. Um, we've got time for definitely a few questions, if there are some. Would society be better if all drugs were legalised? <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> uh, uh, take a drink while I think about that. Um, well, um, I'm not sure about legalised. I suspect we might be a lot better off if they were decriminalised. Um, it's probably going to be the same thing. In the, I mean, the, the, we, clearly the war on drugs has failed. Um, we... we and the collateral consequences of the war on drugs are extraordinary. So we live in a time where some radical rethinking of how we deal with illicit substances is, is required. Um, there are some signs that we're beginning to do some of that. 
Um, but I don't think that we've come close to thinking through, as it were, what the most appropriate forms of regulation are, and more particularly what the role of the state should be in that regulatory process. But certainly it's, it's the best example in some ways of the, of, of the failure of the conceit the, to the, the imagine, to imagine that the, the solution to crime is criminal justice. Um, you know, the solutions to crime, to the extent that they exist, lie elsewhere. Um, the, issues with, the issues with illicit substances, I think, um, are to be found in public health rather than criminal justice. Which is only a partial answer to your only a partial answer to your question, though, whether society will be better off. Um, maybe a little bit biased here, but you mentioned that, that crime may not fall, and it may have gone onto kind of tech platforms and that type of thing. Um, bearing in mind, it was around the mid '90s when crime started falling. Um, is there a possibility that technology actually was a major factor in the drop in crime in terms of ability for police to share information? ability for individuals to protect themselves with things like CCTV, you know, alarm systems on cars, that type of thing? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's absolutely possible that, um, that technology, I mean, technology is undoubtedly important in the sharing of intelligence, in knowing what's going on, in managing risk. Um, it's also potentially, I think, that, the, you know, the, the one of the things that the kind of, um, I, I mentioned, briefly mentioned routine activities theory earlier on. One of the things that that, that is interested in is the, the ways in which we organize our everyday lives. Now, I think that, um, I think that the, the technological changes of the last, whatever, 25 years or so, have probably had quite a dramatic impact on the ways in which, well, they undoubtedly have had a dramatic impact on the ways in which young people spend their time, organize their lives. Um, some of that may be negative, but some of that actually may be very positive. That is, they, they, or it may be mixed, which is to say I think that in some ways one of the consequences of technological change will be um, to lead young people to spend their time in activities which keep them away from some of the criminal opportunities that previously might have been more significant in their lives. So absolutely, I think it can be both. Uh, you said that uh, maybe crime isn't falling as fast as we think. How do you explain the current situation with the increase in knife crime in, in London? Um, specifically in the last sort of six months, I, th I feel like it's become a lot more prevalent, or maybe that's just sensationalism, or, or is there a more deeper sort of social uh, reasoning why this is, this is sort of increased? Well, your question's a great one, but, it, it, but also the phrasing which you recognised, I think, gives something away, because you, you said, I feel. Um, the, you know, the reality with crime trends I think is, is we always have to look in the medium or long term if we can. So the, the short term changes are often very misleading, I think. One of the reasons that we, we feel knife crime is increasing um, is because of how much it's being talked about. And on one level, of course, that's very positive um, because it might indicate that people are taking something that is serious seriously. But if you look at the long-term trends or the, the, the medium-term trends, so the last few years in London, actually knife crime's relatively stable, I would say. There have been some recent increases. Um, but none of that's to suggest we shouldn't take it seriously. I think there are then two things. I mean, one, one question would be a political one. Why, why, so why, why the fuss now? Why knife crime becoming so newsworthy? Well, a variety of reasons. But you couldn't discount the fact that there's a big, with a small p, political campaign around police financing and numbers at the moment um, for a variety of reasons. Um, and that would have to be taken into account, I think. But the other thing that's going on there is that I think, you know, at least some people would argue that if what seems to be a short-term increase turns out to be a more sustained and long-term or medium-term increase in knife crime, 
then that potentially tells us something about the nature of the lives of young males, often young black men, in some of the worst parts, poorest parts of our cities, and what's been happening in their lives over the last half decade or more. Tim, thank you so much for coming in. Um, Pleasure. Tim, you.